Hello, check. The mic is off. Pag nakaon yan. Hindi, hindi naman nakakalit sa Zoom. What could I ever do? Where's my last two minutes? Twenty uh, second run. Can you change the clock? Praise God. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Parang sa hatsada. Kape. Ah, kulang sa kape. Okay. So, welcome to Point of Grace Church, and here we aim to make it feel like home, where strangers feel they are part of the family, where smiles are overflowing and hugs are natural, because we believe that life is a journey, and that we are simply channel of blessings. In our church, we value three things. Gratitude because it's the proper response to God. Excellence because God expects nothing less. And grace because we all need it. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand and worship together? Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Are you all excited to worship the Lord this morning? Amen. And okay, so we're going to do a, a new thing. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, to make it like feel more homey and uh, more exciting okay so we're going to be interactive this morning so when when we sing we want wanna see 
We want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus once more. We want to see, we want to see, we want to see Jesus lifted high. We want to see, we want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Come on now, church. Clap your hands like this. Hallelujah. We praise your name, O oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Our banner the cross across this land. Truth and love, He is the way. One is the tree that lives in high. A banner that flies across this land. Then all when we see the truth and know He is the way. Are you ready? Let's do this. We want to see trees. We want to see. We want to see Jesus lifted high once again. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We want to see Jesus lifted high. Hallelujah. We want to see Jesus lifted high. A banner that flies across this land. The truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus lifted high, a banner that flies across this land. Then all men may see the truth and know He is the way to heaven. We want to see Jesus. We want to see. We wanna see Jesus lifted high. We wanna see Jesus. We wanna see Jesus. We wanna see Jesus lifted high. Amen. We wanna see you lifted high, Father. And step by step, step by step, we're moving forward. Little by little, we're taking ground. Every prayer, powerful weapon, stronghold strong from falling down and down and down and down. It is our hearts cry, God. We're doing it for the last time. We want to see. We wanna see, we wanna see Jesus live for the last time. We wanna see, we wanna see, we wanna see, we wanna see Jesus lifted high. We give you praise, oh God. We give you all the glory. Let us continue to worship the Lord and clap our hands. I give you praise for you deserve it. I give you praise for you deserve it. I give you praise for what you've done. I give you praise for you are able. For you are able. I give you praise till I overcome. I give you praise till the sun is shining. I give you praise till the dark come night. I give you praise when the battle rages. I give you praise till it works out right. The shout of the King is among us. God lives here in all places. The shout. The King is so marvelous. Praise Him, praise Him, praise Him in everything. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise Your name. We praise Your name, O oh God, for You are worthy of our praise. 
your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we confess our sins before you and we repent of our sins in Jesus' name. We sincerely ask you to forgive us our sins in all unrighteousness. Your word also tells us that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Lord, everything we shall ask in your name, it shall be accomplished. Jehovah Rapha, release your healing, especially for those that have been sick and infirm in their bodies. Father, only you can heal them. Lord, send your word and heal them by the wounds of jesus you are healed so heal us lord and we will be healed almighty god you are more powerful than any pandemic there is no virus nor sickness no pain that you cannot overcome you are our healer and our protector jesus we know through your holy spirit you have given sight to the blind, made the paralyzed walk, healed the sick, and resurrected the dead. You have conquered the grave. We know that everything is in your sovereign control. We pray for those who already received the vaccine to be vigilant with the understanding that we can still spread the virus even with our ability to resist <clears throat> be present now to people who need your loving touch because of COVID-19 may they feel your power of healing through the care of doctors and nurses take away their fear anxiety and feelings of isolation 
from people receiving treatment or under quarantine. Give them a sense of purpose in pursuing health and protecting others from exposure with this disease. Protect their families and friends and bring peace to all who love them. We also pray, Father, for the upcoming uh, opening of our school. We bring the principal staff, the maintenance staff of schools and uh, universities, the guardians and the caregivers of our students before you. They are faced with a lot of challenges. They have to make decisions that requires wisdom, understanding. When they feel overwhelmed, <laughs> be present in their lives. May they never feel alone and abandoned. Strengthen them from within so that they might be a source of strength, confidence, and hope for their children. Most of all, we bring before you our students who will be attending in person in our school. As they pursue their education in the midst of this pandemic, enlighten their minds. May they grow in grace and wisdom. Even anything that they lack, provide them knowledge, understanding, counsel, and fortitude. Keep them safe from all illnesses and protect them from all harm. Lord, we cast all our hope, problems, and issues onto you, knowing that all things work together for the good. We love you, Father, and want to thank you for all that you've done for us and will continue to do. This we pray in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let us continue to be in the spirit of worship this morning. Hallelujah, Lord. We want your spirit. Oh God, hallelujah. Truly that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We want to feel your presence this morning, oh God. Let's sing this together. me from your heart fall afresh on me so fill me with your power fill me with your power satisfy my Holy Spirit 
is enough, oh Lord. Your love is enough, oh Lord. Your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord. What could I ever desire? What could I ever desire? What could I ever long for? When your love is enough, oh Lord. Just the people of God sing this, your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord, your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord. What could I ever, what could I ever decide? What could I ever long for when your love is enough? Oh, just the gentleman sing this, your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord. Come on, man of God, sing this. Your love is enough. Thank you, Holy oh Spirit. Lord. What could I ever desire? What could I ever desire? What, what could, could I, I ever long for when your love is enough, oh Lord? And then the women sing, Your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord, your love is enough. Your love is enough, oh Lord. And what could I ever decide? What could I ever long for when your love is enough, oh Lord? Let's sing this together, your love is enough, oh Lord. Your love is enough, oh Lord. Your love is enough, oh Lord. What could I ever desire? What could I ever long for when your love is enough, oh Lord? What could I ever and what could I ever desire? What could I ever long for when your love is enough? Oh Lord, what could I ever? What could I ever desire? Yes, oh God. This is our heart's desire. Your love is enough. When your love is enough. Oh Lord, for the last time, what could I ever desire? What could I ever desire? What could I ever long for when your love is enough? Oh Lord. It's enough now. You're enough. reading for today is from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 1 to 14. Balaam stirred oracle. When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go, as other times, to look for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eye, and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he took his course and said, The oracle of Balaam, the son of Eor, the oracle of the man whose eye is open, the oracle of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel, like palm groves the stretch apart, like gardens beside the river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar beside the waters. Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. God brings him out of Egypt, and is for him like the horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations, his adversaries, 
and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down like a lion and like a lioness who will rose up him up. Blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam and struck his hands together. And Balak said to Balaam, I called you to curse my enemies, and behold, you have blessed them these three times. Therefore, flee to your own place, I said. I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. And Balaam said to Balak, Did I not tell your messenger whom you sent me? If Balak should give me his house full of silver and gold, I will not be able to go beyond the word of the Lord to do either good or bad of my own will. What the Lord speaks, that will I speak. And now, behold, I am going to my people. Come, I will let you know that his people will do to your people in the latter days. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to praise God for the good day today, and I want to praise Him for His unfailing love, for His uh, uh, endless mercy and His grace, and for just never let go of every season in life, in my life and His children's life. So this song may have uh, impacted my life, and I hope you like it too.
Thank you very much. There's something to that, never letting go of God. That's his love for us. That's really very fascinating to all of us. How are you today? Good. A couple of announcements before we start this uh, sermon. Uh, number one, August uh, 6 to 7, there will be a uh, two-day children's day out. It's going to be Friday and Saturday. Friday, there will ha they will have a movie night. And uh, Saturday, 7, they will visit the museum. If you have kids and you're interested, uh, contact Karel or Roussel because they have the details for this one. Uh, second would be the last Sunday of August this month, we have um, the basic stock trading workshop. If you are ever interested in how to make money uh, on the side while you're keeping your jobs and all those stuff about numbers and you want to understand what stock trading is all about, we are offering it uh, for us, for the church, and also for the community. It's our way of giving back. Last but not the least, no, November 25 to 28, November 25 is Thanksgiving. So we want to take advantage of the long holidays. So 25 to 28, we are planning to have a family camp uh, here in South Florida. Uh, I need you to, to uh, press onto your schedule. We would like to know if you are available and uh, are interested so that we can uh, make a final decision on pushing through. But uh, considering also that you know, there's no certainty with this pandemic, so uh, everything is variable at this point. But we would like to plan, uh, even though uh, we're not sure of this. Um, if you can uh, uh, put a foot on your schedule, November 25 to 28, that would be very great. Please confirm it with me so that we, we can begin the price of um, uh, considering this. Having said that, we are um, in our continuing our series, but this time we are switching from the last series to a new series this coming August. It's called the Reversal Series. A lot of things is about reversal in the Bible. Some of the things that we have learned are probably new in the Bible when we read it because there are so many things in the world today that if we try to really understand, is so different from what God is doing. And so this August, this month of August, we, we would like to start with the rever reversal series. This may be provocative in a sense that our pr present understanding of our faith may be a slightly different from what we will learn from this month of August. I say this because it may challenge our assumptions uh, of our faith uh, coming, coming back from a different faith now to having a Christian faith we may probably have assumptions about Christianity, about Jesus, about what the Bible is saying, but we would like to be able to um, make this plain and simple that this coming month, uh, we would like to see how God is, what God is doing and how he is reversing things that we already know. Uh, we're still doing uh, Israel, Balak, and Balaam. It's now chapter 24. We started all the way back to chapter 21. Uh, for those of you, this is a sequel, this is a long sequel, a series. For those of you who did not uh, start with us, uh, beginning in Numbers chapter 21, the nation of Israel started to trek going to the promised land. It's called, called now Canaan. And they're now at the border of Canaan. They're camped in a territory that's not theirs. It's the territory of Moab. And the king of Moab was threatened. So instead of fighting Israel, head on with arms and swords, uh, the king of Moab, King Balak, decided that he will do the spiritual warfare before the swords, you know, the kinetic warfare. So he hired a very powerful sorcerer by the name of Balaam to curse Israel or whoever is protecting Israel to nullify that protection for Israel. That's what's happening here. But chapter 23 of uh, the book of Numbers Balaam already went to the mountain and offered uh, sacrifices of divination to check who's uh, protecting Israel. But doing so, God spoke to Balaam and reverses the curse into blessing. Now, chapter 24 is the third installment of Balaam's oracle. This is a very short narrative. It's just 14 verses. But it talks about uh, instead of blessing, 
just blessing. It talks about a future of Israel that's very distinct from his uh, past oracles, the first two. Now, uh, what's surprising also here is that he was expecting payment at this point because Balak hired him and he's going to pay him. But at the end of the narrative in chap chapter 24, verse 14, he ended up with nothing because he was not able to deliver the curses for Israel. So Balak was very disappointed, and he said, I'm not going to pay you. You go home. And at the end of the narrative, Balaam, too, was disappointed. Um, he, he had to go through all the you know, sacrifices from one mountain top to another. He, at this point, it's the fourth mountain. And he was probably thinking, I'm going to go home with nothing after all the efforts that I did to consult Yahweh. And he even spoke to me, but I did nothing for Balak. So assumption number one is that God only speaks to godly, honorable, and deserving men. There is some intrinsic understanding and assumption that God only speaks to godly, chosen, and worthy men. In other words, Christians, or in the case of the Old Testament, the prophets. Ordinary people would always think that God only speaks to worthy, deserving, and godly men. You see, this assumption is based on a natural thought pattern called merit. We are used to uh, living in this kind of uh, thought pattern because this is how it works. We work, we get paid. You know, we put more effort, we get more results. And so even in religion, even in God speaking and revelation, we also use this thought pattern because we thought or we think that God only speaks to certain people, people who are godly, honorable, and deserving. But it's not true at all. Um, I was checking to see if my son is here. My son asked me a couple of Sundays, a couple of weeks back, if he can have a cell phone. So I said, uh, why? His main argument is that, number one, because all of the kids in Sunday school have cell phones. Um, so I said, no, <laughs> that's not going to fly. He was very disappointed. So his argument number two is because he wants to improve his social life by communicating through cell phone. So I said, no, it's, it's not going to fly. Uh, you have to meet certain age before you have your own cell phone. And in fact, you have to have your own money to buy your own cell phone. That's our deal. Uh, the last thing that he said was, that's not fair. See, the thing is that this statement is based on an assumption that life should be fair. And second, that one should get what one deserves, only the good things, not the bad ones, Okay. It's unfair because I should get what I deserve. And second, life should be fair. I think in a way that we grown-ups also are not far behind in these assumptions because when life hits you hard, our tendency is to cry out foul because we think that life has to be fair and because we think that we deserve better. You see, in the same way, this same argument of deservingness is what we unconsciously use in our assumption that God only speaks to people who are godly, honorable, and deserving. How many of you would assume that God only speaks to priests and pastors? Right? Before, probably, or even probably now, there's a hint that God only speaks to pastors or to the priests. I am just an ordinary person. God may not speak to me, so... I let the, the pastor do his thing with the Bible and I just listen to the sermon because God speaks to the pastor through the word and I listen. But the thing is, the Bible was given to all of us to be able to know the word of God, to be able to discern the will of God because God does not only speak to godly, honorable, deserving men. By implication, if salvation only comes from hearing the gospel, and we asked, what will happen to those people who have not heard the gospel? What about those people who lived in the mountains who have not heard the gospel and they die? Are they going to go to hell just because they did not hear the gospel? See, we ask that because we assume that God only brings the message through godly, honorable, and deserving people like us. The good news is that God can speak also to and through anyone whom he chooses. This is the truth. God speaks to whomever he chooses regardless of whether one deserves or not. 
Fact number one, he spoke to Balaam. Balaam was a sorcerer. He was a pagan. He was not an Israelite. He wasn't a Christian. And yet God spoke to Balaam. It may not be normative for God to speak to other people. Uh, it may be normative for God to speak to the church only or to Christians. But here's the truth. The church, we Christians, do not have the monopoly on the spread of the gospel. That means, it doesn't mean that we can just simply sit back and relax and say, you know, God can also speak to other people without me doing it, so I'll just sit back and relax. What we're saying is that the advancement of the gospel will not be hindered just because we decided to become a showstopper. It will still spread. But God doesn't just speak only through us, God speak, can speak to other people as well. The normative way that God decides to speak to other people is through us, through the preaching of the gospel. But it doesn't limit God's ability to reach out to other people. What makes us think that the prayer of the pastor or the priest is more effective than our prayer? It's probably because we think we have this assumption that God only listens to people who are godly, worthy, and deserving. It's not true. We all have access to God. That's why in the Bible, we are called kingdom of priests. We are all priests to God. We have the this, this same access to God. See, the kingdom of God is not dependent on our ability to carry the plan. Think about this. 5,000 people were fed by Jesus just because of this one boy who willingly donated these loaves of bread and fish. But these loaves of bread and fish is not enough. It was Jesus who multiplied the bread and fish. What I'm saying is that our participation in the proclamation of the kingdom of God is nothing more but a meager bread and fish. And I'm not trying to belittle our sacrifices because the saints have shed their blood for the cause of Christianity, but make no mistake about it. It is only the power of God that the kingdom of God will come to fulfillment. It does not depend on us. It depends on the ability of God. We're still talking about Balaam. So what's fascinating about this chapter, uh, chapter 24, was the content of the third oracle. Sometimes it's kind of hard, really, to penetrate uh, what prophecies are all about because it's kind of cryptic. It's not, it's not very plain and simple. So we have to unpack it. Let me do that for you. Now, we must bear in mind in verse 2 that it says, the Spirit of God came upon him. So it's legitimately that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came to Balaam and God spoke through him. That's true. That's in verse 2. What that means is that God really spoke to him, but not through because Balaam did his work of divination, but because God decided to speak to him even with the divination that he was doing. In fact, at this point in time, he did not do his usual divination to ask God for favor. God spoke to him differently. Verse 1 in chapter 24, it says, When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go, as at other times he looked for omens, but set his face toward the wilderness. You see, what this is saying is that usually from the first oracle to the second oracle, Balaam was offering sacrifices and looking for omens. Omens, what we already explained last Sunday, was he was doing extipicy. Extipicy is choosing an animal, cleaning it up, slicing the animal in two, taking out the entrails, the liver and the lungs particularly, and looking for signs of what God's will is. That's what Balaam was doing. At this point in time, chapter 24, verse 1, Balaam did not do that because God can speak to him even if he does not do his divination. But he already knew the answer of God. He knew that God will not change his mind. God will bless the people of Israel. And so it says, as other times, he did not look at Israel. He looked toward the wilderness. So let's, let's do this. So if this is Israel and this is the offer, Balaam, in other words, Balaam was not happy that God is blessing Israel. So he looked the other way because he cannot be happy with Israel. So he's just saying, okay, I cannot do anything. Bless you. But he's not very happy. In other words, what we're saying is that he changed his mind about God. He knew he cannot change God's mind. He cannot reverse the curse. So he changed his mind. He knew that God was pleased to have Israel be blessed, but he was not happy. The Spirit of God, it says, came upon him. 
which means that God does not speak to Israel exclusively, not just to Moses exclusively. He spoke to Balaam. Here's the truth. God speaks to whomever he chooses, regardless of whether one deserves or not. Let us not think for a second that God only speaks to Christians today. I've heard a lot of testimonies of Muslims coming to faith because they had dreams about Jesus. Many, many testimonies. God can still speak to other people. But here's the question. Why not God just send an angel to speak to Balak? Why does God have to go through all the trouble of speaking to Balaam, the sorcerer? Why does God have to send the spirit to an ungodly sorcerer? Well, sadly, there's no answer here. Perhaps we can just find solace in the fact that it was God's call, it was God's choice to speak to Balaam. God did not explain himself. Probably it is also his way of saying, even Israel, even Moses and Aaron were not worthy. They were rebellious too. So there's no difference at all. Even if Balaam was an unbeliever, Moses and Aaron too were rebellious just like the rest of the people of Israel. Again, God speaks to whomever he chooses, regardless of whether one deserves or not. I want to direct your attention to the third oracle. This is very interesting. Numbers 24, verse 7. It says, Water shall flow from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. It's very interesting. I was looking at the whole oracle and this verse, supposedly, is on the top of it, the peak. Uh, it's not very simple. It, it sounds cryptic. Because what does it mean to have buckets and his seed shall be in many waters? It doesn't make sense. It's not plain English. And this is a little bit tricky. To understand this, we have to unlock this passage by going to a certain passage in the New Testament in John chapter 7. What does water shall flow from his buckets and a seed shall be in many waters. Now, John chapter 7, beginning verse 25, there was an issue of Jesus' identity. Jesus, at this point, had been doing miracles after another, one after another, and people were confused. The Sanhedrin, which is composed of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were confused. To their understanding is that how can somebody who did not, you know, he was uh, illiterate, with their standard. Jesus did not sit in any rabbi. Jesus did not go to a university to study the Bible. So he was, you know, basically a carpenter's son who suddenly from the wilderness say, this is the kingdom of God and I am the son of God. So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were bewildered. How can somebody who makes miracles but did, did not really come from or sit down with a rabbi who did not know the Old Testament do this. He cannot possibly be the Messiah. Other people are also uh, confused. How can somebody have the power to exercise demons and yet th he doesn't subscribe to the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? So they're confused as to Jesus' identity. Who is this Jesus really? Their assumptions and their understanding is based on the fact that they think that God only speaks to deserving godly and moral men and to them because jesus does not submit himself to the pharisees and sadducees he must be immoral ungodly undeserving what i find it very interesting here is that um, in numbers 24 verse 7 uh, water shall flow from his buckets and his seed shall be in many waters is rather cryptic to say that the use of the word water is symbolized by the idea of the Holy Spirit. Now, watch this, because this is very important. The biggest expect expectations of this coming Messiah is that he will come to revive the kingdom and bring the nation to the peak of success and prosperity like David. The Jews understood that if the Messiah come, he will establish or reestablish the kingdom of Israel. They were so focused on a very small definition of God's kingdom, situated in a very tiny real estate in the Middle East, with a very incomplete understanding of the coming king. When Jesus came, he began, began preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Every time he would preach, in parable he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like this. 
and then they would tell us a parable. And so if, if Jesus was heralding a message about the kingdom of God, and Israel is expecting a Messiah who will establish or reestablish the kingdom of God, then there must be a connection. But they cannot connect Jesus to the true Messiah, to their expectations of a Messiah. Now, that's uh, John chapter 7, 25 up to 36. Let's skip the verses. Let's go to verse 37. It says, On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, very interesting. Because all of a sudden, Jesus would say, If anyone is thirsty, I can give you a drink. Does it mean he has a pail of water that he can distribute to the people? What does it mean? What does he mean by that? Let's go a little bit slow on this because we have a lot of unpacking to do. It says, on the last day of the feast, the great day. What is this feast all about? So during this time, according to uh, some research, they were celebrating the feast of the tabernacle. Or some say call it the feast of boots. Or the Jews call it Sukkoth. Um, in Leviticus, they were commanded to celebrate these feasts. For 40 years, they lived in tents. Now, I understand, uh, and it's very interesting and adventurous to live in tents for probably one or two or three days. But to live in a tent for 40 days is, is rather uncomfortable. But God wants them to be reminded of the fact that during those 40 years, God provided food, shelter, and clothing to them. That's very interesting that even until today, the Jews are celebrating Sukkoth, the Feast of Booths or Feast of the Tabernacle. Now, this is the last day of the Feast of Tabernacle. Now, according to their tradition, from the first day to the last day, especially the last day, their tradition was that a priest will come from the temple, carry a golden pitcher, walk to the pool of Siloam, dip the pitcher and fill it with water, and then go back and walk to the temple and pour it on a silver basin on the altar. That's the last day. Now, the distance between the temple and the pool of Siloam is 0.3 miles. It's, it's kind of far. It's a bit of a walk. But, but this um, reenactment has something to do with their tradition that harks back to the time of Solomon. Solomon was the first king who built the first temple. When Solomon was uh, anointed as king, they believed that, according to tradition, that the water from the pool of Siloam was used to anoint him as king and the succeeding kings in Israel. And therefore, whenever the priest would dip his golden pitcher to the water of pool of Siloam and pour it on the silver basin in the altar, they were reenacting and anticipating the coming of the Messiah, the king, the final king. Now, very interestingly, because it says here that they will have a king who is higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Who is this king? So from henceforth, from there, they were anticipating a king, a coming king. You have to remember, in the, in the time of Moses, there was no king, only Moses, the leader. So Balaam anticipated through his oracle that Israel will soon have a king. It's interesting. And so from then on, they were waiting for a king. But where is this king? Where is this coming king? It says in Isaiah 44, verse 3, it says, I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Whenever a priest would pour water to the silver basin and the altar, they were reenacting this kind of prophecy because they believe that a water not just represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will be coming and be poured out on the nation of Israel. Their understanding is that <clears throat> just like in the old days, the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will anoint the king and Israel will receive much, much blessings than before. So whenever they do that, they were reenacting the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the King, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, tradition-wise, every time a king is anointed, he will be anointed with oil, poured out on his head. 
So that's the idea here, the imagery of the Holy Spirit being poured out on them. The Jews understand that water poured on dry land is the image of the Holy Spirit poured out on Israel. Although they already are in the land in the time of Jesus, the pouring of the Holy Spirit is like God coming to visit them and pouring his favor and blessings on them once again. It's the anointing of the king that they have been waiting for. Not just God speaking through the prophets, but God will finally send the king, the ultimate king, to reestablish Israel and fulfill the great Abrahamic promise. I will curse those who bless you. I will bless those who bless you. It is within this cognitive understanding that Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Jesus was alluding to that imagery of water being poured out on the silver basin because he's implying what he's implying is saying that i am the king that you have been waiting for because i can send the holy spirit to you that's what he's trying to say and the people cannot understand that john chapter 7 verse 38 he said whoever believes in me as the scriptures has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water see from his bucket will flow water, and his seed shall be in many waters. This is exactly the parallel of his seed shall be in many waters. That means whoever believes in Jesus as the Messiah will receive the Holy Spirit, and they shall become as buckets where the Holy Spirit will flow to the others in a form of a blessing. The Holy Spirit is the water, the anointing that will flow from the buckets of Israel. What about the second verse? The king shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. This is rather interesting for me. It took me a while to understand this. Because what we know from history is that there was this king Agag. In the whole history of the Bible, there was only one king, Agag, the king of the Amalekites. But he did not live in the time of Moses. He lived in the time of Saul, when Saul was the first king of Israel. The span between Moses and Agag, or Saul, is 400 years. What this means is that Balaam had an oracle that saw 400 years in advance the coming of King Agag. He's very precise. King Agag. That means Balaam was prophesying advance to a point where Israel will have a king that is higher than Agag. So the question is, who is this king that is higher than Agag? according to 1 Samuel in the history, is that Saul, the king, defeated King Agag, but he did not kill King Agag. Samuel was so disappointed. So Samuel asked for King Agag, took his sword, and hacked him to pieces. It was Samuel who destroyed Agag, not Saul. So who is this king that is higher than Agag? It might be David, because David is the one who succeeded Saul. But even we know David... He was not perfect. His family was corrupted. In fact, his one son, the firstborn, became so rebellious he was threatened. Absalom. So, not David, but who? Maybe the succeeding king, Solomon. Solomon, I don't think so. Because when he was old, according to the Bible, his many wives changed his heart and he became an idolater. So from then on, people have been waiting for this coming king higher than Agag. Who is this king? Who is this great king coming to us higher than Agag? If not David, if not Solomon, then who is? Until now, even today, according to their tradition, people are still waiting for the Messiah. They cannot accept that it was Jesus. Because Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was crucified. It doesn't work that way. Power doesn't work that way. If this guy Jesus was powerful, higher than King David and Solomon, then he cannot be crucified. It's, it's the opposite. It doesn't make sense. See, if Balaam was prophesying about this coming king, this king must be very important. In fact, Balaam had a sneak peek like a preview of this coming great king. And Apostle Paul kind of unpacked this for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Because Balaam was correct. He saw the coming king. He said this, Yet among the mature, we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. What is this secret and hidden wisdom of God? Which God decreed before the ages for our glory. 
Verse 8, None of the rulers of this age understood this. By rulers, he means all the sages, the, the wise, the philosophers of this age never understood this wisdom of God. And what is this wisdom? For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The crucifixion of Jesus was the one wisdom of God that no intelligent, smart, sages, philosophers, kings, rulers understood. They all thought Jesus was just an ordinary person, another kind of Messiah. They did not think that he was the ultimate, the one that they've been awaiting for. He was talking about the wisdom of God and the fact that Jesus was crucified. The world understood power using sword and fear. Talk about Caesar and Pilate. Pilate was conversing with Jesus. Did you know, talking to Jesus, that I have the power to release you? Are you the king? And Jesus surprisingly said, it's not within your power to release me. It's God. See, the, the world understood that power has something to do with sword and instilling fear. But the wisdom of God is different. The, word, the wisdom of God is opposite of that. The world understood that God works the other way around. Sorry. The world does not understand that God works the other way around. Think about it. This is uh, very interesting and, and always in reverse. Abraham and Sarai were promised a son, but they waited 25 years for Isaac to come out. When they have no ability to reproduce is when God answered their prayer, Isaac. Very interesting. That means it's not about their ability, it's God's ability to fulfill the promise. Jacob, the second born, received the inheritance instead of Esau. And every time in the New Testament you would read, Esau, I hated Jacob, I have loved. It's, it's not the usual thing that God works. Israel had to wait in Egypt for 400 years as slaves before they plundered and destroyed Egypt. Again, it's not their ability, it is God's ability. See, the only time that Moses were finally ready to lead Israel was after he became a real sheep herder in the mountains after 40 years. He grew up in Egypt for 40 years. He enrolled in the best university, and he thought he was ready. So he killed the Egyptian taskmaster, only to find out that he was not ready. And so God put him there for 40 years in the mountains to shepherd real sheep. And that's when he knew he was ready. See, God works in reverse, not, not the usual way. I can go on and on and give you examples of this and how God works in reverse. But only to prove that it's not about us. It's about him. That's why we say God works in mysterious ways. And yet people still try their best to figure God out. We cannot figure God out. His wisdom is far from us. We simply cannot. Balaam thought that he can figure God out. He did not. In the narrative, there was a great reversal. Have you ever been in a situation where you found yourself running away from God? Doing the opposite because it felt good at the moment? How many times have you realized the more you run away, the more God runs after you? Well, you cannot outpace God. God, is, God runs faster than you. See, the more we run away from God, the more he runs after us. When I was in high school, I already knew that God was, trying, was calling me to the ministry, but I, I refused. Having seen the life of our pastor when I was growing up, they, they were not well off. So I told myself, I want a better life, you know, just like any average Joe. I want things, you know, that glitter, cars and big houses, uh, beautiful wife and smart kids and high-paying job. Well, I got it. Uh, this beautiful wife and smart kids. <laughs> but the thing is that I want to better my life. I wanted to become, you know, in, in our province, I'd say that you know, those who are really successful, the lawyers and the doctors. So I wanted to become either, either lawyer or doctor. So I realized that I have some, you know, I've, a little bit of a, uh, advantage to that. So I took up political science. In my first year in college, I immediately met some cadres from the League of Filipino Students. Uh, the League of Filipino Students is a group of um, students in the universities that is tied to the Communist Party of the Philippines. 
So I had to skip some classes to, you know, to undergo and listen to the lectures of those people who came from the mountains with just slippers on and they were you know, bearing arms. I listened to those people. And I told myself, hey, this is not a bad way to serve my country. So I went in. I remember skipping classes and joining this group. One time we were brought from our province in Quezon, that's uh, uh, south of Manila, about four hours away. We went to Manila. We went to the streets in Mendiola. Mendiola is a very famous street uh, across the Malacanang. Malacanang is the White House of the Philippines. So we were there. We were protesting with other groups. And I, I cannot even remember what, why we were there in the first place. We were you know, a bunch of students from my school. We were protesting. In 1987, before this, because I, I, went, I was there in the 90s, in 87, uh, some farmers from uh, Tarlac went to Mendiola uh, across the Malacanang Palace. And the police opened fire, killed instantly 12 of them, and injuring 50 more. 1987. So I knew when I was joining the League of Filipino Students that you know, this could happen to me. Now I remember on the third night, again, I couldn't even remember why we were there, but when I was looking at you know, my, my fellow students, I was looking at a bunch, of, a bunch of students who have no idea we were there, and we were so aware that the group of, this group of policemen who are you know, barricaded to protect the, the Malacanang Palace, the White House, can easily pull the trigger and kill us. We were soaked, every day we were soaked because we always uh, get the water cannons. And I realized this isn't worth it. So I packed my bags and went home. And that moment I realized that the more I ran after God, the more he was running after me. I was running away from that nudging, calling to be in the ministry, and that God was running after me, making me realize what life is worth about. The truth is, God was running after me. In the same way, what Balaam prophesied was about Jesus, although he did not receive a revelation about the details of the crucifixion of Jesus, but he nevertheless saw Jesus coming. That's almost 1,500 years, give or take. From Balaam to the time of Jesus is about 1,480 something years. Question is, all these years, what has God been waiting for? What was he waiting for? Waiting for the exact moment? There is this passage in Galatians chapter 3 that says, In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. God was waiting for that fullness of time. He was patient about it. He was waiting for the perfect timing because he was working in reverse. All along, the world thought that life is about adding more years. That the more years, you know, if you eat healthy, if you sleep well, if you have a healthy life, then you will add more years to your life. And that the way to God was about performance. And little did we know that it was the reverse. It was the other way around. See, when Lazarus died, Martha was confronted with a very existential threat because they are all going to die. His brother died. And this is what Jesus said to her. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So Martha said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. This is sort of a reverse. Even though we die, we will live, according to Jesus. Because death is not the end of everything that we know. There is life after this one. And the only way to have this life is to believe in Jesus because he is the Messiah. He's the king. Balaam saw him coming. The king of Israel has been waiting for. The king who will destroy the final enemy. According to Romans chapter 8, the final enemy is death. And how did Jesus, the king, conquer death? By dying on the cross. That's the wisdom of God. He conquered death. Something that no one understood at the, that very moment. Even probably the angels, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, I'm trying to imagine the angels were quiet. There was this book that was written by Max Lucado, and the angels were silent. He was telling the readers that during the time that Jesus was hanging on the cross, the angels were quiet. 
because they were bewildered. They were confused. They did not know that this was possible. The king, the God that they were worshiping, was hanging there on the cross, unarmed, unprotected. Instead of crown of glory, Jesus was wearing crown of thorns. Instead of praises and honor, he was slashed 39 times. He was driven nails on his hands and feet. The angels were quiet. But on the third day, he victoriously rose from the dead. And that's the wisdom of God. That's the great reversal. Never anyone thought that that was the end of it. They all thought that was, that was the end of it. All the disciples ran away. They thought that's the end of their career. Three years of sitting at the feet of Jesus went to nothing. But when Jesus rose from the dead, there was a continuation of that life. And what more? Our calling too is a reversal. Listen to Apostle Paul again, 1 Corinthians 1.26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let no one who boasts, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. We are not, you know, by worldly standards, we are not very special people. Or maybe you think you are, but, you know, worldly standards, we are not. We are just ordinary Joes. And yet, of all the, the people in the world, we were chosen for a reason. For a reason. Make no mistake about it. The world thinks that religion is about performance, things that we do to make us worthy to deserve life. That is false. God does not work that way. It is precisely because we were unworthy that by His grace alone, God decided to offer life for free. We need only to believe so that we who believe become His children and thus fulfill the prophecy, His seed shall be in many waters. Have you ever thought of this? The reason why we were doing baptism is the imagery of his seed in many waters. You become the children of God. You become children of God when you committed your life to him. And you concretize that faith when you get baptized in water. So that the imagery becomes complete. His seed shall become in many waters. See, God works in reverse. It is mysterious like a parable and the way to understand is always to wait till the end. It is in the end where God brings everything together. And that's the reason why we were taught to pray, His kingdom come, His will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, this is a very, very long movie. It's not the end yet. We have to wait to the end. There's this roll call in the in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, where there was a roll call about people of faith, beginning from Cain and Abel, and then moving forwards. And at the very end, there was this portion where it says, and they died, they were tortured, they were persecuted. And yet they did not receive what was promised. Very interestingly, because Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. We have not received what was promised to us. We were given tokens. What is the token? Before Jesus, went, uh, before Jesus was crucified, the night before he was crucified, he raised the cup and he said, this is my blood which is given for you. You drink this in remembrance of me. This is a token. In the same way, he raised the bread. He broke it and gave thanks. And he said, this is my body which is given for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. It's a token. What he promised is eternal life. What he promised is to be with him forever. We have not reached that point yet. We're still here in these fragile bodies. But we are given tokens so that we will remember, so that we will not forget who we are and who we are in Christ. And at this very point, we will remember this Lord's Supper. It's very thrilling that night, I can imagine, 
because the disciples did not know what's going on. The disciples just thought it was another supper, but it was his last. So Jesus broke the bread and said, this is my body. This is the token of my promise to you. Whenever you eat this, you are remembering and proclaiming that I'm coming back soon. And then in another verse in, in Mark, it says Maranatha. Maranatha is the Greek word for may you come very soon. Every time we drink the cup and eat the bread, we are proclaiming that Jesus is coming very soon. Do we know when? No, we do not. But we are anticipating that God who never changes his mind, who never lies, will be true to his promise. He will come when it's in the fullness of time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for giving us this assurance of a promise that you never change because you have bound yourself, your character in your promise. Father, we pray that as we remember again with the simple eating of wafer and drinking of this juice, Father, I pray that you will bless our hearts, that you will make us remember once again who we are and who we are in Christ and what he has promised that he will do. In Jesus' name, we pray. You can line up from this portion so that you can get your elements. night that night jesus took the, the bread and he broke it and give thanks and said this is my body eat this in remembrance of me let's eat together in the same way he raised the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. In the Bible, it says that where there is no shedding of the blood, there's no remission of sins. We thank the Lord because this blood symbolizes the forgiveness of our sins. Let's drink together. Let's pray again. Father, will you bless us again as we remember you and your sacrifices for us. Will you bless our hearts and the works of our hands? Will you bless also, Father, our community who are also benefiting from the flow of the blessings coming from us? Father, I pray that with your bread and your cup, we are reminded once again who we are and who we are in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Salamat, Pastor. Are we all blessed? Amen. Amen. So before we sing our last song for today, I just want to share something um, about uh, about giving. In 2 Corinthians 9.7 says, Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Giving is meant to be joyful, expression of thanks to God from our heart and not a legalistic obligation. So if you want to glorify God through giving, we have an offering box at the back. And you can also send it through PGI Zelle account or you can just see the complete details at the back of our leaflets. Shall we all stand? And uh, let us sing this song again. Your love is enough, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Your love is enough. Your love is enough. Oh Lord, your love is enough. Oh Lord, what could I ever, what could I ever desire? And what could I ever long for when your love is enough? Oh Lord, your peace is enough, oh Lord. Your peace is enough. is enough oh lord what could i ever desire and what could i ever long for when your peace is enough oh lord for the last time your love is enough your love is enough oh lord come on sing it church your love is enough, oh Lord. And what could I ever desire? And what could I ever long for? When your love is enough, oh Lord. What could I ever desire? Sunday, everyone. See you next God week. Bless God bless you.